Poor is a seasoned uh, business leader in this country. Uh, known him for many years, seen his growing. He's uh, well educated, as you can see there, and uh, and not only in this country but overseas. But what I like is the service part of Mpo, which is what we promote here. He's been involved in Nelson Mandela's Children Front and uh, and help with fundraising, and he also uh, it's somebody I don't know whether he's still now, but Brand SA. So he's, uh, he's going out there and selling our country. And I think it's much more easier now to do it. <laughs> I guess before the 6th of December, it was very difficult. <laughs> I know that very well myself. Uh, it's very difficult. Um, I always tell the story, you know, when you land in New York uh, during the Mandela times, when you say you're from South Africa, you find this guy who's uh, maybe from Asia, his English is broken, he says, South Africa? <laughs> ah, the guy gets excited, you know. And but uh, these last few, the last ten years have been very difficult. <laughs> uh, so, so, so let's hope the, there's a, the winds of change. But it's all about leadership. So, poor brand SA. But more important is a, is, a, is a chairman of a, a listed company, uh, Acelo Metal, South Africa. He's also chairman of. A, Ilovo Sugar Limited, and uh, so I'm not sure how you're handling the sugar tax, bro. <laughs> uh, I, when we were sitting in the uh, in the holding room, I said, "Hey, you were once upon a time interim chairman and CEO and chairman of ESCOM. How are you feeling today?" He said, "Praise the Lord." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "Thank God." <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but I believe uh, we have hope that that place is going to be turned around. We have to, we have to, we have to turn it around. Uh, and he's a director of many companies, and I'm not going to mention all of them, but Ad, Adcock Ingram is in the banking world, NetBank, and uh, Sepaku Holdings, which is in the cement, and then Epitome Investments. So, Paul is going to share his story. And uh, let's uh, give him a round of applause. Welcome, my brother. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman Khadebe. Uh, where I come from, I would, I'm not allowed to call you Maurice. Uh, I'm not even allowed to call you Babu uh, Khadebe. I'm supposed to either say Bungani or say Mbuli. <laughs> So Mbuli, thank you very much. It's a privilege to have been invited to be here at ULP this evening. Uh, I'm not alone. Uh, members of my family are also here in the audience. Uh, members from where I worship uh, are also here in the audience. Uh, and uh, as I was with you, some colleagues uh, or suppliers also said they came to come and remind me that they do business with uh, Aslo Metal South Africa. When I asked you about the format of the talk, uh, you said it's best for one to come and share a story. But what you didn't do, uh, Bungani, is you didn't say how long I had. <laughs> Um, so I hope that I will be able to do justice to what you've asked me to come and do here this evening. And um, I'll stop whenever you or uh, the SMP says I must stop. I've broken my journey into what the Greek call karos moments. Uh, the Greek people use the word karos to define what, they, what we would call in English life-changing moments. Because I found it difficult to break down the story any other way. Uh, and so the first karos moments uh, would have occurred in the first seven years of my existence. The, the formative years, those seven years, were shaped largely by 
what I call mainstream Christianity, uh, reformed Christianity through the Dutch Reformed Church. My maternal grandfather was one of, in fact, he was the first black priest uh, to, 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 to be ordained as a domineer, as they called them, uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church. My father used to be a circuit steward in the Methodist Church. My paternal grandfather came from, uh, in fact, I must say that in my clan, uh, my, my clan name is Josebo. Uh, I'm Josebo Apol. Uh, all the Josebos that have come before me and my grandfather were renowned healers, traditional healers, Dingak. And so in the first seven years, African herbalism, African spirituality was part of the founding, the foundations of who I was. But a lot of people shaped my formative years, and so in the Karos, the spirit of identifying Karos moments, the first person that I need to single out that would have shaped my journey would be my paternal grandmother. Uh, her clan name is Nasabagadi. Nasabagadi Amudia. She made me appreciate who I was from my platform heritage of being an African. Um, we come from various bloodlines of royalty in my family, both on my mother's side uh, and both on my paternal grandmother's side. Um, and so she wanted me to understand my place in the lineage of those that came before me, but most importantly, how to carry the burden that came that she saw that came with that lineage. Our family totem is the lion. So essentially you would come across a Magwana and you would say Mutau. But we're also from Boroka, which is the east, Baroka. Our roots uh, are in the place of the rising sun in the town of Leidenberg. And so what was paramount for her is that she wanted me, when I'm with fellow Baroka, when I'm with fellow Batau, but most importantly, when I'm with fellow Africans, that I needed to be able to identify myself. Uh, uh, and so my Karos moment, firstly, was exactly that, that Moroka is a can get. Moroka is some, something that is precious that you just don't find. And therefore, I was taught from that very early age, between birth and age of seven, that I needed to conduct myself in a manner that was befitting of that kudos of being a Morocco, Morocco or shock. The second thing she were at pains to inculcate in me, and remember this is not from a religious platform, it is purely from an African platform. She said to me, uh, meaning my, both my grandfathers on both sides in terms of the royal heritage that I spoke about, uh, you must underline that. She didn't say, she 
Tajile lingwe udlo swana na abu. Uchave mutu mroka. Uske wakwisha abatu shoku kakudu kudu wa shoki. Lebadicha. Kaore meo khuyabona. Ebalala. Ewela sakadibe chung samudi. So any of you that like me may have grown having to go and fetch water. Sakadibejo is when you put your hands together to receive water from a tap or to dip into a well to drink water. So for those who don't understand Sipedi, the instruction was that I was duty bound to that as I followed in the footsteps of those who came before me and perhaps started like them to be recognized as somebody in the community. When that day arrived, my duty was to not respect a human being, but to almost revere in a fearful manner. Because uh, my duty was to make sure that I did not hurt people that I touched. Because when they get hurt, especially the poor and the underprivileged, their tears fall directly into God's in the palms of God's hands. The second person that I was very attached to, I am Josebo III, is my grandfather, Josebo II. He was known among his peers as Ditavi because traditional leaders, traditional healers, and many felt that in his presence they could draw wisdom through which as rulers of traditional realms they could do so. And as a descendant of a great Ngak, Ntabanyani, Oseba the first, they felt that in him they would find someone who knew herbs, who would teach them how to mix which herb with which uh, to ach help people achieve healing the African way. But most importantly, he taught me that the role of a father as a provider, as the hunter for the family, is a role that is never ending. So every time we went to town, our favorite town, his favorite town was Leidenberg, which became my favorite town because that's where we came from. He would make sure that uh, even though all his uh, four children worked and they lived in their own homes, he would buy 50 kgs of ace milli meal for each of the four, sugar, flour, and all that he thought they needed from his generation of what grocery meant. Uh, we would go to the local dairy and he would buy 25, five, five liters, so five times uh, five liters of milk. Uh, each family would get their five liter share and his own household would get uh, its own share and he would go in and buy two full sheep and have them have it dissected and cut down to provide for all the families. And so until his death aged 86, that's what he did every time he went to town, even with his pension money. He was an entrepreneur eventually retired from business, but even with his pension money, he always tried to make sure that that's what he did for his children and grandchildren. So my point here is that as business leaders, as fathers, husbands, we need to remember that that duty is never ending and you fulfill it until your, your last day to the grave. Phase two of the formative years is the period between then age seven leading up to age 18, or perhaps 16. As I went to high school, COSAS taught me that we are members of society before we are anything else. And my generation came and led in COSAS at the tail end of it having been just been banned. Uh, at the 
tail end of the legacy of 1976. And so most people that recruited me into COSAS and eventually into the struggle, we then thought we would create our own organizations to fill the gap that was left by those bannings. And so in the area where I went to high school, I ended up uh, carrying that flag and becoming chairperson of an organization called Moscow, Mawadumo Student Congress. And so like most young people then that would have done that, I tasted detention for the first time when I was 14 years of age for three months. And then secondly, at age 16, uh, I was made to disappear with a few other people uh, into some remotely hidden police station called Malepis, uh, Maleps Drift in Afrikaans, until through the help of the likes of Priscilla Jana and many such uh, legal champions, we were then located and transferred to a central prison in Bulukwan. But in the period starting from age seven, my spiritual, spirituality changed when my parents became part of the International Pentecost Holiness Church. Most of you call it the Modisa Church. And so the tone of my spirituality was shaped by the teachings that I was exposed to the first day I went to the Sabbath. So in me, a lot of you, uh, some are shy, some do ask, are you a policeman? Every time they see me wearing this star, this is the star of David. And it locates my spirituality in a blend of African spirituality, but African spirituality that doesn't worship at the graves. So I haven't spoken to ancestors since age seven. The second blend of that spirituality is Judaic. My dietary way of living is kosher, I would say, it's Judaic. Uh, I worship on Saturday on the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And so the first message that I received on my first Sabbath was a message that said, you will never see God with a naked eye. Moto. That you can never purport to love and fear God when you are unable to relate to the God that you're sitting next to right now. Most of us will not talk to the person we're sitting next to. But on Sunday, we're going to say amen in church. The very person sitting next to you that you're not talking to is God. Because uh, that someone went, in to say, went on to say in South Sotho, Ana hauze hore meloa hao ke tempele ya mudi. Loho ba moya wa mudi mu wa agile hoena. Egar hao e senya, mudi mu tlao senya. Oba ni tempele o ya halalela. Me tempele o kiwe. So, Hatred is something that the temple you live in doesn't like. Jealousy is something that the temple you live in can't deal with. And many other things that perhaps we don't have time to talk about tonight. But simply, my godliness is only complete when I recognize the God that dwells in you. Later in life, around 2012, a friend introduced me to a book called The Birth Order Book, written by Kevin Lehman. The Birth Order Book articulates that your order in your family in terms of whether you're a firstborn, second, third, or lastborn is closely linked in terms of how it shapes your character. And so I would suggest that the lessons I drew out of it may be lessons some of you may draw out of it uh, as you listen tonight saying, how do I get to understand who I am better? Because leadership is impossible 
without a good sense of self-mastery. For me, uh, I'm a firstborn, so I, I think I'm a typical firstborn, but I am also an extreme version of a, of a firstborn because detention at age 14 and detention at age 16 does certain things to you. It makes you more inwardly withdrawn. Um, and so on, on, on the TED Talks, one talk that I always resonate with is a talk uh, on, on the TED Talk series, you can look it up, it's called The Power of the Introvert. It doesn't mean that all of us to be outgoing, to be successful, have to be extroverts. It has actually been determined that 30% of Fortune 500 CEOs that have cemented a lasting legacy are actually introverts. So I'm, I have a, a visible public profile, but actually in my private space, I'm a very private person and very introverted. So some people tend to think they have to change and become extroverted to please others so that they can be acceptable as a leader. Not the case. The next phase is uh, the early adulthood university and work. The impact of student politics at Ngoye, where I did my undergrad, University of Zuland, uh, where I left, I, I, I didn't want to go to the University of Limpopo because uh, when we were activists, we used to have shadows uh, in the form of the special branch. Uh, I had two shadows, one was a common shadow uh, to many, known as Kruger, and then I also had another one called Fuxi, a German Afrikaner. So I reckoned if I went to the University of Limpopo, I was not going to have quality time to study, because the inevitable would happen, I would still go there and be an activist. And so let me go far away where I'm not known. And so I went uh, 720 kilometers away from home only to have the inevitable happen. Uh, as a first year, it's uncommon in your first year to be elected to, into anything. So in my first year, I was already a member of the SRC and also on the executive committee of the South African National Student Congress. Some people that I was with there uh, are our Minister of Social Development, uh, bless her soul, <laughs> uh, and many others who graduated from the University of Zuland. But while there, my lessons in leadership cemented uh, because I came across two people who shaped how I today think about uh, some of the things, Chairman, you've been talking about. Uh, Perfect Malimela was one of the black, first black consultants in change management. And he had been mentored by Don Kwanas. The lion. And so our SRC became the first of its kind during our times to have a strategic business plan, which was facilitated by Perfect Malimel. And so we managed to win a few battles that many thought were not winnable. I also had inspiration from the likes of Linda Zama, who was our attorney. And through that, got to learn how to challenge things systematically through the legal system, rather than merely relying on throwing stones. I became a student member of NADEL, National Association of Democratic Lawyers, because somewhere in my training, I did some courses in law. And there, I met the inspirational Albi Sachs. And the precious moments we had with him was like, uh, if a Christian has had a moment with an angel from heaven. It's moments we cherished forever and ever. Advocate Pius Langer, Advocate Sony, are among the few that in the limited time I have, I'll just mention their names as people who have shaped my Karos moments as a student. Upon graduation, I started working and then 
South Africa was opening up. The, uh, the political parties were becoming unbanned. We had just had the Battle of Quito Carnival in 89. So I decided, why not enroll for management at the University of Pretoria? And found myself being the first black student in the faculty of management. Uh, we were taught in Afrikaans and we, wrote, we were given the privilege to write our assignments and exams in English. There I met Christo Nell, uh, among them Andris Nell, who is our Deputy Minister of Social Development, became a friend and a comrade. But Christo Nell organized something similar to what you're doing, Chairman, called TAXA. Transformation Action Group South Africa, and he took young people from different persuasions politically and put us all uh, in the famous uh, Hartepia Sport places that people used to go for Bosbarats and said, as you can see, Mr. Mandela is about to be released. Uh, a lot of things are going to change. What do you think should happen? when South Africa moves forward. And it was quite remarkable that some of the things we debated then found their way into the CODESA process when people were talking about self-determination, the right of languages, and so forth and so forth. And it made one realize that small things, you don't have to be at the main table at CODESA. Small things that you do in small spaces can find their way. And in fact, there's a book that every young person should read by an academic from one of the places where I did my management training called Brian Uzi, UZZI. He published a book called Six Degrees of Separation. That if you wanted to have dinner today or soon, not necessarily right now today, but soon with say President Ramaphosa, you are six degrees removed from that dinner happening which simply means there's somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody in your network that can make that possible. And so that's why you have to have authentic relationships with people. Because if you only have opportunistic relationships with people, only remember people when you need things from them, you damage that six degrees of separation. The Black Management Forum uh, in 1993 established a thing called the Affirmative Action Alliance, chaired by, among others, then Deputy Secretary of COSATU, Zulinzi Mavavi, uh, and uh, another friend, Caroline White, and my corporate mentor, Lot Ndlov. And they asked me to coordinate the university participants, uh, given that I was the youngest in the room. And so I did so, and that got me closer to the Black Management Forum. But in the middle of that, I got, uh, I guess, suddenly you become visible, opportunities start rushing at you, and I got an opportunity through Ford Motor Company to go to live in Detroit, in Dearborn, uh, near Motor, in Motown, uh, as a foreign trainee in HR and transformation, or what was called change management. And so that foreign exposure, I'm mentioning it tonight because often we become too localized and too bound to our homes and we do not want to, to be independent. I've been living away from home since I was 12. Uh, so since 12 at boarding school, I've learned to fend for myself. Since 14 in prison, I've learned to survive. 16, I learned to survive. And so being away from home has never been a challenge for me, but most people tend to do everything staying at home. And maybe some only get to be away from home when they get to university. Uh, but you need to stretch yourself out of your comfort zone. And when opportunities arise for you to go and live in Cuba, to live in Russia, to live wherever in the world, accept them. Because that's how you're going to grow and learn. I've already acknowledged Lot and Lovu. Of all the mentors and managers I've worked with, when he was executive director of the BMF, 
he was looking to appoint someone as head of organizational transformation. Our interview lasted 10 minutes. And he said to me, Paul, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, let's go find the person who must do the paperwork. Uh, when can you start? But from him, I learned a lot of things. When uh, I was asked to champion, at the time, the BMF Basoto had formula, and go from company to company to champion the, what we, we, we had as blueprint targets for affirmative action. Through that, I got exposed. I wasn't part of it. I got exposed to it. Uh, a record moment in South Africa called the Mobani Record of Understanding. It was where the economics departments of the liberation movement, under the leadership of Don Mkonas, who was president of the BMF at the time, uh, and some select members of the black business organizations, NAFCOC, BMF, and FAPCOS, the likes of Jabu Mabuza, are a product of that Karos moment, where a, a document on, you must listen carefully, a document on economic empowerment and economic transformation was published. This thing was never called BEE. It became BEE later elsewhere due to other motives. Uh, it has always been about economic empowerment and economic transformation. In BMF, we always said, when it comes to organizational transformation, the candidate for transformation is not the organization, is not the individual. So it's not about changing white males to turn them into these wonderful white male African lovers. It was about changing the systems and policies that give a culture and perpetuate a culture of privilege. And similarly, in the economy, it was about that. It was about dismantling those systems in the economy that perpetuate privilege so that you can achieve equal participation. That's a period, uh, an author that stood up in my career and introduced me to the school of systems thinking is Peter Senge. Um, in the 90s, early 90s, his book, Fifth Discipline, was the field book that every strategist, change manager uh, used. And I think even today, any person who wants to be an effective leader must understand systems thinking. Everything is interrelated. The most important thing that systems thinking teaches you is the iceberg theory, that you must never solve problems at the surface of the iceberg. In other words, at the things that meet the eye. That which is visible to you is deceiving you, preventing you from seeing what lies beneath the surface. And part of our problems today in South Africa is that we're solving problems at the tip of the iceberg level. Uh, because when you deal with problems at the bottom, so to give you a controversial example, when President Mbeki asked in parliament whether a syndrome causes a disease, and we said he was being denial about HIV AIDS, he was asking a systems thinking question. He was asking whether we were solving the HIV AIDS pandemic at the time dealing with its root causes. Because to solve a problem, you must go underneath it and look for patterns, for things that give you what you see above the surface. And so what he was challenging was the fact that we were not looking at a country as who's manufacturing these antiretrovirals at the time, at what price, at what impact. And in some instances, we were being asked to be guinea pigs of antiretrovirals at that time that were not yet tried and tested, just by way of a footnote. I'm not defending him, I'm explaining systems thinking. <laughs> the other leader that stood out for me in the mid to late 90s, uh, author rather, thought leader, is Joel Barker. He published a book in 1999 around the time that a lot of people, a lot of us were worried about a thing called Y2K or were made to worry about a thing called Y2K, that as midnight strikes and 1999 changes into 2000s, computers would get stuck. Your money in the bank would be frozen. <laughs> Planes were going to crash in the air because computers are stuck. And many other things we were told. New Year's Day, year 2000, life was the same. But he offered a definition of a leader that uh, I use in my work and I live by. He says, a leader is someone you choose to follow to a place you wouldn't go by yourself. 
because he says the job of the leader is to recognize and secure the future. And then come back to your followers uh, a bit like Moses coming from the mountaintop and say, this is the future I'm selling to you. So as leaders, we need to earn the right to be followed rather than demand or command the right to be followed. And therefore, you must be an inspiring leader that is forward-looking, that is outward-looking, that leads the organization that you're charged with from what we call outside-in rather than inside-out. Inside-out means you move from the premise that you are good at what you're doing and the, the world needs you. Bad assumption. Outside-in means we've got something to offer, but that look, let's put ourselves in the shoes of the users, of people in the supply chain, of stakeholders, customers, and say, how do they want us to provide them with what we be, believe we're good at? I won't dwell in detail because I'm mindful that I shouldn't run out of time. The next phase, and obviously allow time for questions. The next phase uh, of Caro's moments, they presented themselves uh, around this Y2K thing and uh, perhaps the first 10 years of the 2000s. In 1996, uh, after a lot of pursuit, uh, Minister Mboweni said to me, you know, every time I go, I hear that there was this guy from the BMF talking about affirmative action. Every time I go, maybe it's time you come and work with me. And we had met previously in terms of work. Uh, the BMF had asked me to be part of the economics team uh, that drafted the RDP. So the RDP had five chapters, and one of the chapters, uh, a few of us got to participate in shaping in terms of uh, the economy. And so he said, even in the RDP, I heard how you sometimes tackle us uh, as we're preparing to go into government. So 1995 eventually convinced me to sign on the dotted line. So I then found myself being the first director for equal opportunities that shaped the policy that created the Employment Equity Act. And so between Tito Mboen and Sipo I also have two leaders that I've learned from and worked with and perhaps experienced a Karos moment together with quite a few. Not far from here is Rangis Fontaine. Um, there's, there is the Center for Innovative Leadership run, founded by Louis van der Merve, uh, who's a renowned practitioner in scenario thinking. He's the one who introduced me to Peter Senge because he once hosted Peter Senge here in South Africa there's a whole video that was developed around systems thinking being applied in South Africa. You see, the story that uh, you were telling, Bob Khadewe, uh, about the Mandela taxi, there's also other cutting edge things that we were respected for since the unbanning and how the movement chose to assume power. And one of them was, it was understood already through the likes of Rural Cause and others that African leadership in its essence and character is systems thinking. And so a lot of system thinkers came to South Africa to come and learn about the African dimension of systems thinking. And so here at Rangis Fontaine, I then got introduced to Peter Senge. But most importantly, the Karos moments that Louis uh, enabled for me as a friend and in his case as a renowned thought leader was participation in the school of scenario thinking. And I got involved with uh, scenarios for the SA Breweries Division in 99 and MTN scenarios. So the things you're doing with smartphones today, in 1997, we had conversations around convergence, data and voice convergence in terms of what would happen the day that brick phone, Motorola, the, those of you who have gray hair in the room remember, uh, what would happen the day an Ericsson or a Motorola or a Nokia could do more than phone and text. And so we had these engagements around how it would change how people work. And my passion as a techno junkie got unleashed then because in high school, uh, I was meant, I was at a technical high school uh, where these detentions I was talking about, and I was meant to pursue a career in electronic engineering. But it was in prison uh, number two in, uh, when I went for the second time 
that we bombed in there, we were put in the same cell with people who had been to Robben Island, the People's University. And so I changed there and there and realized my love and passion for management and economics. And when I was released, we had the difficult conversation at home. Over and above being a jailbird, we also had difficult conversations about my choice of how I wanted to pursue my career moving forward. And so uh, the school of scenario thinking, especially the MTN scenarios, shaped that. Brand building. I then found myself, again by sheer coincidence, the deputy CEO of an organization at the time, before it, it, it shortened its name, it used to be called Ogilvy and Mather, right, sip, right slip, trip, and making. Uh, that's where I met them, Lapos, for the first time. They were doing a project with uh, Metropolitan, and Metropolitan was a client of ours. And so we came, spoke to them about branding. They came, came to talk to them about branding and what Ndatem Lab at the time had begun to do with the work that you're doing together. Uh, you've done together and you're doing together now with Ndatem Khadem. But the turning point for me, being at Ogilvy, was when Martin Sorrell, a world-renowned British CA, by our language, a chartered accountant, decided to acquire a string of ad agencies which were deemed non-mainstream of the economy. And when he was asked why are you doing this, he said, you know, some of the most valuable assets are those that accountants cannot count yet. And so this question of intangible value that today seems common, uh, how do you account for intangibles on your balance sheet? Is it goodwill, is it this, is it that? I got to really grapple with it for the first time while at Ogilvy. Around that same time, I came across, was exposed to this notion of neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, psychologists, I don't know if there are any in the room, were being challenged by this new thinking that said traditional psychology was too binary and therefore is problem solving in terms of how psychologists and industrial psychologists were working with leaders they were inspiring them, channeling them in a direction that made them binary. They saw the world in either or. And in South Africa, we were building this new democracy, this rainbow nation, we couldn't afford either or. We wanted a world of both and. And so neuro-linguistic programming became the first deviation from classical psychology that said actually, the, the brain is not just divided into the left and the right. It has a center. And the brain also is a front faculty, a center faculty, and a rear faculty. And they then used the biological foundation of the human being, and they could show that in the stem, uh, the reason why when you are sad or when you've been stressed at home, the pain you feel the most is here, is because that's the locus of your emotional cortex is here. Uh, the brain cortex, yes, if you're feeling challenged from a lateral thinking point of view, you might have a headache on the right side uh, and so forth. And psychologists can explain better when you have a stroke on the left side of the brain, what the cause is, and on the right side, the cause is it. But neuro-linguistic programming said the value system of the left brain is what is called pain-pleasure principle, which is essentially what the Western way is. No pain no gain. If I work harder, I'm going to get a bigger office, a bigger checkbook, a, a better company car. The right brain is creative. It allows you to live your inspiration and so forth. And the focus area, the value system that drives right brain thinking is not pain pleasure, but it is fulfillment. The artist that draws a picture feels incredibly inspired and fulfilled when people admire their picture, their painting. But the value system that most of us Africans have been raised to believe in, the value system of Ubuntu, is actually center brain value system and center brain thinking. Because it is taught, we were taught to be focused and fulfilled. 
who were taught to be what neurolinguistic programming calls being other person centered. Whereas left brain thinking tends to be about me, pain, pleasure, self centered. The right brain tends to say, yes, I'm useful if I inspire others. But it falls little short of the value system of Ubuntu. Center brain is the locus of Ubuntu, and center brain is about, I'm only whole if you are whole. I'm only solving the problem holistically if I'm solving the whole system. And so it brought with it a language of understanding each other called VAKOG, V-A-K-O-G. If you're interested, there's a book called Accelerated Learning in the 21st Century. Um, and VAKOG says whether you're Russian, whether you're Indian, whether you're Zulu, Kosa, Mupedi from my home province, we all speak a language called VAKOG. There are those of us who solve problems at the V of the VAKOG, which is visual. And so, I don't have time, but in Q&A I can expand. But visual problem solvers are those that when you present things to them, you must go and show them. Take your PowerPoint, take your slides to go and show and tell. Um, if they have an engineering background, go with your models to go and show and tell. Um, if they are an engineer in the oil sector, go with all your uh, templates of a refinery and show how f things flow. You are likely to get a decision out of such a leader if they are visual. The A is auditory. One of the best auditory leaders in our times is Madiba. People that worked in Madiba's cabinet used to complain that you go to union buildings, he's called you for a meeting, you go rushing with papers to present. He had a, a, a recliner chair that was black that he always sat on and he would fold his arms and listen. No note taking, no interfering, you just listening. And most, many a cabinet leader would walk out of Madiba's office disgruntled. I spoke to this old man who was not even listening to me and then the Motorola while you're in the car of the minister, the Motorola rings those big brick phones. And on the other side is Madiba. He says, Minister so-and-so, when you said one, two, three, four, five, did I hear you correctly to mean one, two, three? And you say, yes, Madiba. And when you said it, it goes into this way and this way, did I hear you correctly to mean this? Yes, Madiba. You've got my permission. So you've been cursing him, mocking him that he was not listening, but actually he's been listening uh, because they, they learn and absorb information in auditory. So you don't take PowerPoint to such a leader because they're not going to watch your PowerPoints. They just want to listen. Kinesthetic is uh, said to be something that uh, most women folk have and married people in the room have uh, been many a victim of kinesthetic female behavior. Um, kinesthetic people will believe until they can touch and feel what you're saying. And so in a bank, a credit manager would have to be kinesthetic because until they can touch and feel your balance sheet and income statement, they won't give you that overdraft. <laughs> so again, when you go there, or if you're a salesman selling cars, the moment you hear someone says, you say to them, so what is it that you like about this car? And you say, I just want to feel how it drives. That person is buying a car because they're looking for safety. You say to them, hang on, I'm going to get the number plates for the garage, keys, I'll be right with you. You do all the things and then you get into the car and you say, as a salesman, I just want you to let me drive it a little bit and then I'll give it to you. You make sure you do those curves at 140 so that the person can feel how safe the car doesn't serve. And you keep on saying, you see, it's got six airbags, airbag here, airbag here, airbag here. And then now you, after you've said all those things, you say, now you can drive. That person is going to buy because they're not buying the car for its looks. They're buying the car for how safe it's going to make them feel. Whereas the visual buyer will be interested in the paint and the design and the look, and feel, look of the car, the aesthetics. O is the most difficult, it's prevalent in the military, is the oil factory. Um, it's where environments that work according to dictates. In the, in the military, it's all about chain of command and following instructions to the core. And so 
uh, there it's the most difficult uh, thing to work in. G is gastronomic. You find it largely in large organizations. You find it also in government. You go with all your song and dance to present something. And they say, yeah, no, we, we hear you, Mr. Khadev. Uh, won't you let us digest it? We'll come back to you. <laughs> so they're going to chew on it and digest it with the gastronomic system. I realize that I'm beginning to run out of time. So I'm going to cherry pick one or two things. At the turn of this part of the century, the sec the, the, we're now in the second and a half decade of the century. An author that I respected from a network I belonged to through the scenario thinking called Eamon Kelly published a book called Powerful Times, which I encourage every young person to read or any person that, want, that aspires to be in leadership. It helps you appreciate the complexity of how the world works. He starts the book by saying, the universe is consistent on time in presenting humanity with options, but humanity is consistent in ignoring it. There's no way we should be talking about day zero when it's around the corner. The universe told us under the National Party rule already that at some point Cape Town would run out of water. The ANC government came. Uh, people have been leaders of the Western Cape, but they ignored this. Just like in 1993, ESCOM Council went to the new incoming government and said, we're going to run out of power in a decade. And they said, what do you mean we've got more power than we need? So the depth of it is that you must prepare in advance, read symptoms of change, and ride that wave of change. Everything I learned and, and, and knew converged for the first time when I became Group CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi in the 2000s later CEO of the Marketing Federation. And my father passed on in 2004. Being the firstborn, I felt duty-bound to go home and attend to his affairs and became provincial director at Standard Bank. Uh, when you see the economy from the ground uh, as a head of a bank in a province, it's quite something. You see it, the economy totally different uh, in terms of what lies beneath the aspect. Don't have time to explain but it was a Karos moment. Then, of course, the biggest of them all occurred in 2009, November. I still remember it was the 21st of November when I was asked to assume both the responsibilities of interim chair and CEO of ESCOM at the same time. This was, for all intents and purposes at that time, the largest company in South Africa. In 2009, my need had 110 billion rands worth of assets in terms of its value. And as today they say, if ESCOM doesn't work, we've got no country to talk about. Uh, it was a major learning curve, uh, major growth, and until my term ended on 27 June 2011, as they say, the rest is history. In closing, Chairman, a book was published in 2013 that all of us as leaders should pay attention to, especially in business. A woman known as Rita Gunther McGrath in 2013 published a book called The End of Competitive Advantage. Every business school until 2013 taught people that you've got to find your sweet spot and nurture and carve your competitive advantage. And she challenged all that, and I have been following her since 2013. And she says, competitive advantage is temporary. And there are many examples. Blackberry have learned that the hard way. Polaroid have learned the hard way. 3M learned the hard way, and so did Nokia. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, people can continue to interact with me with these kind of dialogues at line3.co.za. It was a privilege to be called upon to be here today, tonight, to share with you. I hope I did justice to it, Chairman, because uh, we agreed I was not going to use slides and PowerPoint. And so 
maybe there are things you never associated me with that uh, maybe you're shocked or surprised or whatever. Uh, but that's my journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those questions. Um, you know, the first question about what am I puts me on the spot because as I've said to you, I'm a private person. <laughs> I certainly don't fall in the G. I'm not a procrastinating leader. I certainly don't fall in the O. I operate mostly in the VAC, V-A-K, but by, by first origin, I'm a visual leader. By training and teaching from the likes of Nashabagadi, my grandmother, and many uh, of second nature auditory, um, I've had to consciously learn to be a listener over the years. Um, in terms of the K, I applied purely in the dictates of my grandmother never to hurt people emotionally. But the strength that I have that has made me arrive where I am is that I'm naturally an objective, independent thinker. So I never let emotions cloud my decision making. Sometimes to a point of perhaps being accused of being cold. Um, you can't lead, because you have to transcend if you're to lead well, especially in times of crisis, especially with dealing with the kind of leadership that you have to deal with when you lead uh, in complex industrial environments. Uh, even in, in, in the banks, if you're a board member or a chair of a board of a bank, you have to be your best rational thinker. And therefore, your kinesthetic part must be the conscience that says, don't harm, don't hurt, do good. But you've got to rise above it and find the most objective uh, outcomes uh, that transcends the problems. Uh, like Mahatma Gandhi said, you can't be in the same level of consciousness of when the problem, the problem was created in, if you're able to solve it. So I would see myself as largely uh, VAK in terms of uh, the fact that I don't work with robots or live with robots, but first nature is visual. In terms of uh, the question uh, that uh, Makama, you said Makama, uh, around the empowerment of SMMEs and enterprise development initiatives, until recently, I was chairman of a fund called uh, JSS Mining Empowerment. And there I learned that every entrepreneur, when they engage with the likes of Ndatikhatebe, who is, among others, based at Sasso, should learn to appreciate a thing called Section 12J of the Income Tax Act. I wish I had gotten to know of this early in my career. Section 12J of the Income uh, Tax Act uh, matured with the BE Act. It's been there, but underutilized, but as the BE Act went through its uh, various uh, mutations, it says that any company, so f firstly, any number of individuals, provided they've got the requisite financial skills within them, can set up a 12J fund. So Mamlap was talking about uh, training and so forth, and Dadakade was talking about Katoras and so on. The point I'm raising, let's say in Katoras, let's pick on the infamous street that uh, divides Tokoz and Gatlo. Let's say you wanted to build a public commuting system there, so you need to buy a few buses, put some rails, put some bus stops. Let's make a practical example like that. 
you could identify a few young people and say to them, find, you at least need a CA or someone financially minded among them. Set up this Section 12J fund, uh, and then all they have to do is probably come to you and say, is there room to tap into Sasol's Enterprise Development Fund? Uh, but you could say to them, no, I'll only put five rand or whatever healthy amount. I don't want to raise ideas and then people start chasing you for millions. So uh, I'll put five rand into the Section 12J fund, provided you go and find maybe a transport company like a Transnet to also put five rand. So there you are, you've got 10 rand. You can multiply it into whatever, magnify it into whatever number. And between Sasol and Transnet, because the question you must always answer when you come with ideas is what's in it for the person who must fund? And the what's in it for the two companies in this example is they would each get 28% rebate in tax rebate out of the funds they've put in. So the JSS mining fund, we went to Stefanuti stocks. They put 600 million rands into the fund to enable us to fund junior miners. So unfortunately, that 600 million is, de is de depleted in a matter of a year. So now we've got no funds to fund further. So you as an entrepreneur can sit with fellow entrepreneurs and say, what is the problem we want to solve? Create a Section 12J fund, register it with SARS, and then approach uh, organizations that are likely to have enterprise development money to spend, because they need points on their BE scorecard. And you can say to them, for every rent you give me, you are going to be able to claim 28% back from SARS in tax rebates. That for me in today's world, I would say, in the spirit of ask not what your country can do for you, but facilitate small entrepreneurial opportunities in that manner. The only challenge is that fund is limited to doing physical things, infrastructure, mining, building things, and so forth. As long as there's capex involved, you can stretch that enterprise development budget. So hopefully that's an idea. I can give it to you for free and that they have your makam. Nabe, uh, thank you very much for your complimentary comments. Uh, you've asked a very difficult question on how we achieve progressive leadership to move Africa forward. I think there are people that are already doing this. Uh, I am privileged to interact once in a while uh, with the great Nigerian um, who owns uh, 38, 40 percent of a group that I'm involved with called Sepaku. Um, I think he's doing a lot to try and change the image and picture of Nigeria. Every time I have the opportunity to be at home on a Sunday, around 2, 3 o'clock, there's a, a program on CNN Africa that always showcases these Africans. I would suggest people must watch because often they leave their details to say those who want to deal with me and so on. The other thing that the World Economic Forum is doing well, uh, incidentally, when Dr. Khadeva asked me to come and speak here, we were together at the World Economic Forum uh, in Durban last year. It took that long for me to be here. Um, the World Economic Forum has a thing called uh, Young Global Leaders. So if you have a brother or a sister who is a high achiever, who's under 30, encourage them to go on the website uh, of the World Economic Forum and, and, and apply to become a young global leader. Because as they say, you are as good as the company you keep. So we must make sure that the average young person aspires to become a young global leader because the YGL program gives you a network to tap into of many powerful people globally uh, in Davos that are looking for young talent to back. And that's the quickest way, by being talented, that you get to become part of the solution. I think we should all be saying, how do I become part of the solution, rather than who's going to solve the problem for me? And perhaps with the permission of the hosts, let me share with you a technique. There's a, a leader who wrote a book 
uh, entitled the QBQ. Learn to answer, to ask the QBQ, the question behind the question. He says that in, when you're confronted with a problem like the challenge, the big challenge you've just thrown onto, the big elephant you've thrown into the room, when you start solving it by saying, when are African leaders going to become progressive, you are asking a procrastinating question. Because when means it's going to happen someday, sometime. If you start asking the same problem by saying, but why are African leaders not accelerating, you're again robbing yourself because you're asking a question from the platform of a victim, assuming things happen to us rather than us being able to make things happen on the problem. If you ask the same question by saying, who can help us to make African leaders progressive, you're again deferring to some super individual who's going to knock their heads and sense into their heads and help it solve. Not going to move forward. So he says we must all avoid being baganiers. Uh, he says we might, we're like my baganier, we do this when we're confronted by problems. He calls it the company code of arms. Every company has got a code of arms somehow that points things away from it. He says you start first with I. So instead of saying when, who, what, what, start solving problems by saying, what can I do as Napi to solve this problem of lack of progressive leadership and poor utilization of, of minerals? Because when you start saying what, you're asking yourself conceptually what, so you're gonna, your mind is going to flow with conceptual thoughts. Can I, it focuses you to act, so what concept can I do? So what can I do to solve this problem? Or he says, start by saying how, because how focuses your mind in terms of that chain that the chairman was talking about. How starts saying problem solve, problem solve, problem solve. How can I be involved with a solution that makes African leadership move forward? So time is limited. I don't want to be a bad guest where you uh, you become a guest in Sesotho with long horns. Yeah. So that uh, next time Empower works uh, and ULP don't invite me because they say this one, you invite him. Uh, <laughs>